Hi, this is the Tropical Tidbit for Friday evening, September 18th. As always, the thoughts here are mine alone, and in making decisions, consult the National Hurricane Center and your local weather office for the best information. While this crazy Atlantic hurricane season continues, we have more named storms in the Atlantic. We had the formation of Tropical Storm Wilfred out in the central Atlantic, which is not expected to be a threat to land and will likely decay over the next few days. But Wilfred was the W storm, and there is no X, Y, and Z, so that's the last name in the English alphabet for this year's list of storms. The only other time that list has been exhausted was 2005, and just like we did in that year, we now begin the Greek alphabet for naming storms. And what happened in the same morning this morning is the subtropical cyclone that we noted over here west of Portugal yesterday has now gone off your screen and actually made landfall in Portugal and brought strong winds and heavy rains to the coastline there. But that took the name subtropical storm Alpha, the first letter in the Greek alphabet. We then had tropical depression 22 here gain tropical storm force winds 40 miles per hour. So now it has earned a name and is now tropical storm Beta. And so that is where we stand today. More storms to track and unfortunately more land threats here with both Beta and Hurricane Teddy being potentially substantial threats to land areas going through this weekend and next week. If we start with Beta in the Gulf of Mexico, we can see that the storm has moved a little bit to the north northeast of where it was yesterday, and we can kind of see it spinning in here with a little bit of a sheared look to it. We do have an upper level trough over Texas currently inducing a little bit of southwesterly flow aloft, so we see a lot of the thunderstorm activity on the northeastern side of where the low level center is right now. And we can see that upper level trough on water vapor imagery a little bit better here. It's a little hard to see over Texas, but you see the southwest flow over the Gulf. And uh, you can also see some of this darker gray starting to encroach on uh, beta. And some of this dry air is going to get wrapped in around the south side of the storm and perhaps eventually uh, become an inhibitor on beta's intensity in a couple of days. If we remind ourselves what the overall uh, synoptic scale pattern is around this tropical storm, this is the GFS upper level flow. Here's where beta is now. Here's this upper level trough that you can see better in the model here. This is progressing eastward over time. So if we go forward, you'll see this trough kind of lift out over Arkansas and Mississippi and tropical storm beta gets left behind and begins to turn more toward the west as we have a little bit of ridging building in to its northeast here. So the wind shear goes down as that occurs, so we have much lighter flow aloft, and uh, so the shear becomes less of an inhibitor after we get into Sunday and Monday. But if we look at the moisture field on the GFS, again we have some of this dry air over Texas and a little bit over Mexico here starting to get wrapped in over the next couple of days. So you'll see some of that happen where by Sunday, although the shear has gone down, we have some dry air over Texas start to get wrapped in. You can see a tongue of that uh, getting around the south side on this model forecast. And the future intensity of beta will depend very much on whether this dry air chokes off the thunderstorms right over the uh, storm's center and causes weakening, or if it isolates a core of strong thunderstorms that the dry air simply wraps around but never into the center, in which case the storm would be allowed to stay stronger because the thunderstorm activity remains intact around the center. On the GFS, you get a little bit of a mix here where the dry air gets in, but this core of green never gets destroyed by the dry air. And so on the GFS, it's able to intensify into a hurricane near South Texas by the time we get to Monday, despite the dry air moving in around the core. Now, if we look at the H wharf instead, you get a little bit of a different opinion here, where on this particular model, what you'll see is that when it moves toward Texas, this dry air starts to infiltrate. And by the time it gets toward the coast, you can see the dry air come right into the center of circulation. Instead of going around, it goes right into the center. And that results in a weaker storm than on the GFS at landfall here. And this landfall forecast is also a little bit sensitive because the steering currents are going to decrease a little bit 
when the storm is near the Texas coastline. We have a mid-level ridge to the north that is not particularly strong. And eventually, as we look at this upper level flow on the GFS, all this westerly flow aloft is going to take over again and eventually try to push the storm back off toward the east or northeast. So in general, what we're expecting here is a track that hooks to the left toward the coast as this ridge initially builds north of the storm. And then the ridge decays and the storm has to turn toward the east once more. Whether this occurs over water near Texas or over the land mass of Texas itself will be very important for, for example, Louisiana down the line in case we have a storm that remains over water and is still strong when it gets to Louisiana. And we can see on the GFS uh, that what happens here is it stays very close to the coastline for a couple of days, moving very slowly, unfortunately meaning a potential flooding event for South Texas and then scooting along the coastline and remaining fairly strong as it moves past Galveston Bay and then into Louisiana. Again, this is very dependent on whether it's actually inland. On the H Wharf, the storm is able to get just far enough west that it's over Texas and then quickly weakens. And on this particular model run, there is no storm headed into Louisiana or the Houston Galveston area because it got inland and, it was, and was able to weaken. So you can see here that even like a 50 mile difference could mean a lot. So this forecast has a lot of uncertainty just because of whether it's water or land that the storm passes over during Sunday and Monday. And so this is the official forecast from the National Hurricane Center showing this general path where it hooks to the left and then turns back toward the right. And uh, again, very slow moving storm. Five days from now, it hasn't really moved that far. And it's very close to the Texas coastline. And you can see the cone of uncertainty here quite large at day five. So whether this is actually close enough to Texas to bring significant wind and rain, is a question and it's not uh, something that we can know for sure just yet but a lot of model guidance does bring this in pretty tight to the coast so i think at this point you have to assume that storm impacts are likely coming for the coastline of texas and you should be probably prepared for heavy rains and the potential for some strong winds nhc does have this getting to hurricane intensity What's the reasonable range of outcomes here? Again, it depends on how much that dry air gets in and chokes off the storm center over the weekend. If it is able to choke off the center, you might see winds of, you know, maybe 45, 50 miles per hour might be the low end here for a moderate strength tropical storm. If the core is able to remain intact, you know, you could see a hurricane with 80 mile per hour winds might be a reasonable maximum based on the guidance that we're seeing right now. So somewhere in that vicinity, you know, 50 to 80 mile per hour winds may be possible if this is close to the coast and then heavy rain also a possibility if it's close enough to texas to bring that rain and so that is going to be a concern we'll talk about that more uh tomorrow and sunday when this is getting closer and then for louisiana i do want to point out that although the forecast in five days does not bring it into louisiana yet and we don't know if it's going to make it there as a storm because it might move over texas and weaken it is a uh, a large plume of moisture on the eastern side of the storm that will be getting into Louisiana, even when the storm is down here near Brownsville in Corpus Christi. So just to point that out, there is actually rain coming on the east side of this further up the Gulf Coast, and uh, we will have to potentially be concerned about flash flooding if a lot of that rain does fall over a couple of days while this storm is just sitting here pumping tropical moisture northward. So that is going to be a concern even well away from the core of Beta as it moves toward Texas. So we'll keep a close eye on this over the next few days. Slow mover, uncertainty, but likely to bring some hazardous weather to at least the Texas coastline uh, by the time we get past Sunday or so. We're gonna move back now to the big picture and talk about the other land threat, Hurricane Douglas out in the central Atlantic. And if we take a close look at the infrared picture today, we continue to have a major hurricane with winds that are probably more like category three intensity right now. And I can actually check the latest advisor from the NHC. Yeah, 125 mile per hour winds is category three at this point as it's starting to get very large and at this point is unlikely to strengthen a whole lot simply because of its size. If we look at the uh, microwave pass from 4 p.m. Eastern time this afternoon, we'll see the eyewall surrounded by a very large band that's wrapping around, not really a secondary eyewall right now, but kind of 
illustrates that some of this environmental dry air might be starting to entrain a little bit, and this band could theoretically tighten up, contract, and become a second eye wall at some point during the next couple of days. Normally when that happens, an eye wall replacement cycle occurs wherein the storm's wind field becomes a little bit weaker in terms of the maximum winds, but it tends to broaden out and become quite expansive, which can you know, be bad for impacts to places like Bermuda and eventually Canada. This is the data set from the recon aircraft this afternoon showing the low pressure down in the 950s and this very large area of purple here indicating hurricane force wind at flight level just showing how big Teddy is here and this large size uh, can sometimes limit a hurricane's intensity in this part of the Atlantic because the warm water is not particularly deep and a large hurricane tends to upwell cooler water even ahead of itself, like the strong wind on this north side may cool the water before the eye wall is even able to move over that same water and that's where the warm water is needed most is in the eye wall. So sometimes a hurricane can actually limit itself because of the, because of the ocean upwelling. And we can see that uh, Teddy is currently moving over ocean heat content that is of you know moderate values here in green certainly more than enough to continue sustaining it as a major hurricane over the next couple of days but as it gets toward bermuda which is up here you get this cooler patch of blue where there's much less ocean heat content because paulette moved through the region as we've discussed the last couple of days and this is likely to cause a period of weakening for Teddy as it moves over this cooler patch of water. Once it gets beyond Bermuda, the water may recover and get a little bit warmer again, but never quite to the warmth and depth that the storm is moving over currently. So Teddy may have already reached the strongest intensity that it's going to be for the remainder of its life, but it could still easily be a hurricane packing winds of greater than 100 miles per hour as it nears Bermuda and beyond. This is the uh, GFS steering forecast uh, starting at the 500 millibar height here on uh, Friday afternoon as of the making of this video. There's where Teddy is. Here's the ridge to the northeast that's currently steering the storm with southeasterly wind pushing the storm toward the northwest. And uh, there's Bermuda on the model. And fortunately, the model trend here has been toward a track that's nudging a little bit farther to the east of the island. So you can see that as this trough dives down from New England, as we've been talking about, it's going to kick the storm up toward the north and east and this is occurring now on the modeling uh, at least enough away from Bermuda to prevent a significant direct hit. So here on the GFS and also in the Euro, which I'll show you in a second, it's not a huge hit to the island, which is good news. If, as we have this trough dive down though, it's going to now swing the storm perhaps back toward the north and west by a little bit up toward Atlantic Canada. And you can see this interaction between the trough and the hurricane such that you get a little slingshot here to the north and then once it's aligned such that the trough is to the south of the hurricane now the hurricane slows down a little bit and pauses before turning back toward the northeast unfortunately this is going to occur very close to nova scotia according to most model guidance now and as we've discussed this is unlikely to swing all the way into new england uh, that has always been a, a fairly unlikely solution for this storm and we now see model guidance coming to a better agreement that this is going to only come as far west as Nova Scotia and then continue on to the Northeast. We'll keep an eye for any adjustments here, uh, but now that we're within about four days of this and models are in good agreement, this is more or less the kind of track that we're expecting. You can see it turn off toward the Northeast here over Nova Scotia and portions of Newfoundland on this model forecast. If we look at the European model, we'll see something uh, fairly similar here where the storm is again to the Southwest of this ridge. It comes up once again to the east of Bermuda, so fortunately not a direct hit on this forecast. You can see the trough come down from New England, swing it up toward Nova Scotia, and then a track on toward the northeast. So the European model is now not as far west as it was. It and the GFS are in good agreement on a track more or less like this uh, by the time we get to Tuesday and Wednesday. And unfortunately, a fairly significant impact to Canada is likely coming from this with this uh, intimate interaction between the mid-level trough and the hurricane, we're likely to see this transition to something that looks more non-tropical by the time it gets to this point. You're unlikely to see an eye and an eye wall and a core of strong thunderstorms, but what you will see is a giant comma cloud here in a very intense wind field, similar to what Hurricane Sandy was for the eastern U.S. in 2012, but this time, unfortunately, for southeast Canada. This is a depiction of what we could see 
uh, lurking off of the coastline of Canada on Tuesday morning on the H wharf, showing the 850 millibar wind field. And just how large this is, this expanse of purple indicates roughly the region where you could get hurricane force wind gusts uh, at the surface on this model run. And again, the storm could be, you know, couple hundred miles you know left or right of this position but it's such a large wind field that it seems difficult now to avoid a direct impact of this storm on Nova Scotia first and then Newfoundland later as the storm turns toward the northeast on Tuesday and Wednesday and so you can see it enveloping this region here so storm surge downed trees power outages all going to be significant concerns here as this is probably about as severe of a hurricane impact as you can get in Canada in general even though it will be moving over colder water offshore it's going to get close to Nova Scotia quickly enough that it's likely to remain very powerful uh, even as it weakens toward the northeast here even as it's weaker on Wednesday we get a very strong swath of wind into Newfoundland, which will likely see less impacts than Nova Scotia, but still potentially significant. And so this is likely to rank highly in hurricane events for Southeast Canada based on current forecasts right now. This is the official one from the National Hurricane Center showing the general track that we just described toward Bermuda, then turning to the right and then back to the left, unfortunately bringing this over Southeastern Canada by Tuesday and Wednesday. You can see it maybe slow down here just a little bit as it does this turn. And uh, during this time, it will be weakening, but still a large wind field as we just saw on that H wharf run. And you can see the cone here again, plus or minus 100 miles, 200 miles. But in general, even if it's on the left side of the cone or the right side of the cone, severe impacts likely coming to probably both Nova Scotia and Newfoundland, this whole region here. Uh, so do keep that in mind, uh, even perhaps up to the north of Newfoundland, we may see impacts uh, going into Wednesday and Thursday. So significant impact coming, do be prepared and stay safe if you're in Canada and also stay safe in the Gulf as we have potential for heavy rain in uh, Louisiana as well as Texas when this turns toward the west and gets close to the coast there in a couple of days. That's it for now. Thanks for watching.